Welcome to this IANA webinar, Compressed Natural Gas for Intermodal, How to Save Money, Meet Sustainability Targets, and Capture Grant Funding. I'm Hal Pollard, the Director of Education at IANA, and I'm pleased to introduce our panel today. Eric Bippis from Agility Fuel Solutions will talk about the basics of natural gas in trucking applications. Tom Swenson from Cummings Westport will cover meeting emissions goals with near-zero emissions engines. Greg Roche from Clean Energy Fuels will speak to fueling infrastructure and renewable natural gas. And wrapping it up, Jason Lewis from SoCal Gas will cover grant funding availability. So with that, let's get started. Eric? Thank you, Hal. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the association. I think Agility is very excited to do that. And uh, a little bit about Agility before we get started. Agility is a manufacturer of fuel systems and solutions, so the storage of natural gas or hydrogen or electric, electricity, anything for propelling commercial vehicles. Agility makes the containment vessels, which are type 4 cylinders, uh, out of our Lincoln, Nebraska facility. And then we make these systems that, that flow the, the gas or energy back through the method of propulsion, in which case we're talking about combustion engines. So why natural gas? Some of the questions that we hear frequently in the field from fleets are either a new adopter that is considering alternative fuels or an existing fleet that has maybe tried it in the past, maybe didn't have a good experience, and now we come back to them and say, okay, here's a great opportunity, or they're interested in improving their overall carbon footprint of their fleet. Some of the questions we get, you know, is it safe? Um, is it profitable? Will it affect my ability to retain drivers? Will drivers like to drive that vehicle that's powered by either liquid natural gas or compressed natural gas? What is my offering with the OEMs? What's the engine offering? What sort of engines can I get and how do they perform today? You know, has it improved over the last five years? These are some of the questions that we'll try to answer for you today with the various uh, speakers that we have. What I'm gonna do is focus a little bit on um, the trucking business as it is today in North America. So today, natural gas engines are available in class four through eight. Uh, that includes uh, turbo tractors, day cabs, sleeper trucks. Uh, there's spike, spark united engines up to 12 liters and 400 horsepower. Tom Swenson from Cummins Westport will talk to you more about the great offering that they're bringing to the marketplace right now and how that's reduced emissions footprint. And the typical application for natural gas trucks is regional haul day cabs, which would be perfect for intermodal operators around the port, um, return to base vehicles. And in the past, what we've seen is, you know, fleets have dipped their toe into natural gas applications and trucks. However, it maybe didn't fit their usage pattern. It has really changed over the last five years from an infrastructure standpoint in the ability to fill that vehicle up if it's, you know, three, four, five, 600 miles away from base and the ability to keep that truck on the road. And with the introduction of uh, exhaust Selective catalyst return, DPS. Now we're looking at compressed natural gas trucks where their operating costs are significantly lower. And we're very excited about that. When we take a look at some of the different applications, uh, we've got pictures here of three different vehicles, one of them being a, uh, what we call a pro rail system, a side mount system, a backup cab system in the middle there where you see the truck behind the driver's seat. There's a, a four cylinder, 175 uh, diesel gallon equivalent system in that. And then the extreme long range applications like you see in the lower right, you'd have both the back of cab and side mount systems or pro rail systems as we call them at agility. And that can achieve well over a thousand miles. And those can be propelled either by liquid natural gas, which would be a side mount system, compressed natural gas, which would be typically four type four cylinders with 360 uh, a pound PSI tanks. Most trucks today that we see in the class eight space are running the CNG and they're able to achieve 700 plus miles in a typical application. Now, when we look at natural gas, because you have the addition of the fuel system and, and the engine upgrade to the natural gas engine, there is considerable upfront cost. And we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the things that can be mitigated through incentive programs that are out there today, but also the real key factor in that is the operating costs over a two, three year period of time how you can pay that back very, very quickly and have a nice return. So why natural gas? The number one question. Natural gas as it is today, the engines are 90% cleaner than the current diesel offering that's out there. 
So the Cummins Westport Ultra Low Knox engine is 90% cleaner than the EPA's Knox standard, 90% cleaner than the cleanest available diesel engine in the market today. And if you couple that with, if you look at the U.S. population, roughly half of the U.S. population, or 166 million people, live in an area that the American Lung Association has said unhealthy to breathe the air. And if you take that into a microenvironment, such as the ports of LA, Long Beach, LA, New York City, it's more like 100% of the people that live in those areas are breathing air that is absolutely not unhealthy. And if you've flown into LA or New York or any of these cities during key smogger, you can see it in the air. So there's a compelling reason for fleets and businesses to move in this direction. And if we take it one step further and take a look at natural gas and how we, when you go from well to wheel, how you can re reduce your greenhouse gas footprint. If you have a fleet that is running liquid natural gas, you can reduce your footprint by 11 percent. If they're running comp compressed natural gas, it's about a 17 percent reduction. But the real exciting thing that has been evolving over the last couple of years and really spearheaded by clean energy and Greg Roche is going to talk to you more about that in a little while is the introduction in large quantities of renewable natural gas. So the difference between conventional gas, which is fossil fuel that comes up from the ground, and rather than in fossil fuel does, fossil natural gas does emit methane into the atmosphere. So actually capturing that and burning that through a combustion engine is cleaner than letting that escape into the atmosphere. But the exciting thing is around RNG and renewable natural gas, and that is capturing gas that emits from landfills, uh, wastewater biogas, farm and crop waste, food waste, and then dairy waste that is, once again, methane gas that is evaporating into the atmosphere. Instead of letting that happen, we capture that and we burn it through the combustion engine. A fleet that is running RNG can reduce well-to-wheel carbon footprint by 40 to 125 percent reduction. It's really significant and impactful uh, on the environment and reducing the number of Americans and North Americans that live in an unhealthy environment. However, as we know, if you have a great technology, if the cost of that technology is prohibitive, it's very difficult to drive adoption. And in the next slide, we talk about how we can save money for the fleet. So if we take a look at natural gas versus diesel, traditionally, natural gas is a considerably more stable fuel in that when you look at the makeup of the cost of natural gas, 23% is the raw commodity itself, roughly, and roughly 77% is the processing and distribution of it, versus diesel, where you have 60% of the cost of the fuel being wrapped up in the commodity cost. And we know the crude oil is highly volatile in the marketplace. If you look at the last six, seven years alone, you've seen volatility going from highs over 100 to lows that are extremely low. So it's a highly volatile, very difficult to project what your fleet is going to, your operating cost will be over a five year period of time unlike natural gas where it's been very stable. Your typical savings on uh, natural gas versus a diesel fuel will be anywhere from 75 cents to a dollar. It can be even more than that if the price of crude oil goes up over a period of time. In addition to the operating costs, when we look at the benefits of fleets, and we're really seeing this now as the diesel fleet that is post-SCR, so diesel particulate filters, uh, diesel oxidation catalyst, and SCR, which require diesel exhaust fluid, are now getting to be in that six, seven, eight, nine year range. And you're seeing a lot of replacement of these exhaust components, especially if the fleet's duty cycle is extreme where they do not regenerate at highway speeds and you see a lot of low power regeneration. High operating cost of that diesel fleet as it ages. In some cases, we see data that's as much as two to three X per mile versus the natural gas fleet. So lower maintenance and total operating costs, there you see a quote from Jim Fish, waste management CEO, who is now driving to about 80% adoption of natural gas vehicles in their fleet. And that is a very, very severe duty fleet where they're operating in landfills, they're operating in residential areas, and it's, it's a very aggressive environment and they're having an excellent payback. And most of that is around their operational cost savings of natural gas versus diesel. In addition to that, talking about some of the questions that I raised very early on as well, what affect my driver retention. One of the key feedbacks we get very quickly from fleets that are driving, that have switched from diesel to natural gas, is my drivers say how quiet they are, how, what a reduction in cost, how much smoother the engine is versus that diesel engine. 
So that in, in, when you look at environments such as New York City or some of these environments that have noise restrictions for early morning routes, compressed natural gas or a natural gas vehicle can be a great advantage there. Now, there's a big buzz in the marketplace regarding EVs, you know, hybrid vehicles. Um, we see Tesla out there, we see Nikola and other manufacturers that are, have the EV offering. And very simply, when you take a look at the range requirements of your typical Class A fleet in your delivery fleet requiring sometimes 700 miles of range, there is not an EV vehicle out there uh, powered for Class 8 applications, even for Class 7 applications, that can even come close to the range that you get out of your natural gas vehicle. When you look at filling times and that, that user interface, the, the filling times and the user interface of a natural gas vehicle today is very comparable to a diesel vehicle. So from a driver standpoint and a maintenance standpoint, you have a very similar interaction. Unlike in an EV where you have to have charge your vehicle overnight, you have to have very, very different infrastructure requirements versus what's out there. And another thing, and I believe Tom um, Swinton's going to talk a little bit more about this, is when you look at the lowest cost available per ton source of well-to-wheel reduction in, in greenhouse gas, SOX, NOx, emissions reduction, renewable natural gas is actually better, more efficient, and cheaper to reduce emissions for the environment in general than the EV vehicle. And we'll explain that in more detail in a few slides down the road. And then finally, when you look at trying to pack enough batteries onto a commercial vehicle to give you the range that you require to do your daily cycle, you are eliminating potential payload that you will have. There's a cost disadvantage there as well. And then finally, in the last slide, um, we talk about some of the fleets that are, that are operating natural gas, UPS, waste management, Frito-Lay, Pepsi. All these fleets have made a serious commitment to do two things. Number one, invest in their fleet in natural gas and the training and the requirement. And number two, there's a sustainability message that they push out to the marketplace because they want to be seen as that green fleet, that fleet that is taking product from whether it be the port to the distribution center to the factory to the home. They want to be seen, they project that as a competitive advantage, not only from a cost standpoint, that they're saving on maintenance and operating costs, but also as the ability to project their business and the image of their business as doing something for the environment. And we see that more and more now, but even with the, the fluctuations of fuel prices, that projection of them having that green footprint is very strong. So with that, I am going to turn control over to Mr. Swenson from Cummins Westport, who will talk to us about near zero emissions engines. Great, Eric. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, again, Tom Swenson, I'm uh, with Cummins Westport. So we build the engine, the low, low NOx engine that runs on natural gas. All right, so we uh, we actually offer three different platforms of, of engines for, for different duty cycles. Our latest offering is is our 12-liter product, the ISX-12N. Uh, that's certified at the ultra-low NOx number of 0.02 gram NOx, and it offers up to 400 horsepower and, and 1,450 pound-feet of torque, uh, which is for applications up to 80,000 pounds. Our 9-liter and our 6.7-liter product, the 9-liter is really designed around vocational, pickup and delivery, uh, refuse, transit bus, those kinds of applications. And then the 6.7 is in smaller applications like yard spotters, school buses, um, those sorts of things. You may have heard or had some experiences in 80,000-pound applications. The natural gas engine doesn't work really well. What happened historically was the 9-liter engine, which is really designed around 66,000 vocational applications as, as kind of its limit, did get deployed into 80,000-pound applications. And frankly, it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit. The, uh, the engine performed fine in the sense that it, it, it did what it, it was capable of doing. It's just frankly too small uh, for the application. So the 12 liter, uh, which has the, been deployed into into regional haul applications, up to 80,000 pounds, including going up over uh, significant grades like the Grapevine out of LA, has been very well received, and uh, and performance has not been has not been an issue. So just just a bit about the technology. So it is spark ignited, and we use stoichiometric uh, combustion. It's a very robust platform. We use 80 percent of the same platform uh, as the diesel counterpart. And so basically the whole bottom end of the engine is very, very robust. And, and, and we're seeing 
extremely long uh, service cycles out of these engines uh, because of that robustness that's already built in. If you do have issues or for regular service need, the engine is fully serviced and supported through the Cummins network. And that includes not just the, the distributor locations, uh, but the OEM dealers and the independent dealers. Um, many of them have the capability to work on uh, the natural gas product. We also use Cool DGR, which is incorporated into the diesel product as well. However, we don't have the diesel soot to, to, uh, to deal with, so we don't get the clogging of the EGR valve that you can sometimes see in the diesel side. We use a three-way catalyst, which, which really is, is, is a muffler that happens to have a catalyst in it. There's no filter, there's no secondary injection of, of fluid like urea that you have to, to deal with. And finally, closed off the crankcase so you don't get any of that hydrocarbon that kind of leaks out and of the engine is, is sort of normal practice. We loop that back into the, into the engine and burn it. So we've made some, some, some product improvements over time. The, uh, the 12 liter has really been around uh, driving toward that really low emission level. And so we made a few changes around uh, that, which is some changes to the fuel system, dealing with crankcase emissions, and, and a slightly larger catalyst, which again is, is really just a muffler. For those of you that, that may have some experience with the nine liter product, we used aluminum pistons uh, initially in that product. And what we found was they didn't always stand up to the duty cycles that, uh, that people were putting them into. And so we moved to a steel piston, which we've always used in the 12 and the 6.7 liter. And so if you've got vocational applications where the nine liters used, the steel pistons have made a huge improvement. So just a little more on the on the catalyst. So it 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 is it acts as the muffler. You can mount it vertically or horizontally. It, it's it's the same experience as you have would have on your on your gasoline passenger car. It doesn't require any cleaning or maintenance. It doesn't have to be regenerated. So there's there's no duty cycle that that you can get into to where it will give you a headache. It whether you're idling or you're rolling down the highway. Uh, it automatically uh, takes care of itself. So you don't have to worry about these heat requirements or having a light come on that says, oh, I got to pull over and, and put this thing through a regen and, and, and get it to clean itself. It's, it's, a, it's a truly no maintenance required system. This was mentioned by Eric, it's much quieter in operation. Um, and and what we found, sort of interestingly enough, is you start to hear things that, that you wouldn't have normally heard in, in a diesel application. For example, when when somebody is around a natural gas engine that's running, a lot of times you'll hear kind of this clacking uh, noise, and they would bring them in for service and say there's something, there's a strange noise coming from the engine, and it, and it turns out it's the air compressor which you wouldn't hear in, in a, when it's installed on a diesel engine. So it's very, very quiet. And feedback that we've gotten from folks that are, that are using the technology is, is they, the drivers really like it because one, it's quiet. They don't, you know, they don't have to deal with that, that constant noise that the diesel engine uh, tends to produce. Another thing that we kind of didn't anticipate is the drivers have reported that they really enjoy not going home smelling like diesel fuel. And it's really helped their home life a fair amount too. So that, that's been kind of a, an interesting side benefit that we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, anticipate. So just moving to the maintenance. So this is a bit of an eye chart and I, and I certainly don't expect folks to try to capture all this, but just it's provided here and, and the slide deck of course will be provided to folks um, after the presentation, just to show the, the maintenance on the system. It looks very similar to the diesel counterparts. Uh, probably the biggest difference would be the spark plugs need to be changed because the diesel engine, of course, doesn't have spark plugs. So availability. The engines are available in all of the OEMs. Uh, so it's basically take your pick. For the 12 liter product, uh, the only one that's not offering it is International slash Navistar, uh, but you can get it in Kenworth, Peterbilt, Freightliner, Volvo, Mac, and uh, an auto car. And so there's availability is not an issue, other than you got to find a build slot, which seems to be the, the biggest challenge these days. Um, all of the engines are built alongside 
our diesel counterparts. Uh, the 12 liter is built in Jamestown, New York, and we have a minimum order quantity of one, uh, meaning that you can, you can order one uh, at any time, in any quantity, and the build will will just get slotted into uh, into the line. Uh, we'll build it and we'll ship it to the to the OEM of your choice. All of the truck OEMs have integrated the engine in, into their ordering system, so it's not a special process. You just go through their standard ordering process and uh, get your build slot and 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 have the truck built and delivered. Just a quick note to follow up on the comments that Eric made. Uh, these engines really are on par with electrics when you take into account where the power gets generated from, because the, the electrons from EVs don't just appear. Uh, they have to be generated somehow. Um, although our engine is certified at 0 0.02, it actually performs at 0 0.01, which is on par with some of the cleanest electric generation in the uh, in the country. So it's it's really a great option where you've got the emission these emission sensitive areas, uh, which ports tend to to kind of be. So Eric also covered this uh, briefly, but there's a lot of talk now about going to a carbon neutral energy system. And one of the things that that we've been able to to do is utilize this renewable natural gas which is going to get produced. So all of these waste streams <clears throat> that we're generating, we're now able to, to really convert them from waste into a useful energy commodity, if you will. And so we're seeing folks that generate these kinds of things, so refuse folks and dairies and, and uh, wastewater treatment plants, they're now taking what used to be waste, um, converting it to, the, to fuel instead of just releasing it to the atmosphere, and then we're able to take that and use it in these engines uh, to, to move goods and service. It's really a, a great closed loop. It also turns out that once you have these systems up and running, uh, the, the gas cost is, is really inexpensive. So it, it, it turns out that this waste to gas really is a, is a very efficient and economically wonderful choice to, to, to make. So I'll finish up here with, uh, we have a playbook, we call it a natural gas playbook, which is really just a set of resources uh, for somebody to, the fleet operator to go in and, and kind of do a what if, you know, what if I chose this and, and what would be the, be the results? And, and so there's, a, there's fuel economy and, and performance and, and emission reductions and, and those kinds of tools on the website, it's, it's, West, it's CumminsWestport.com. The other thing that I'll leave you with is if you do choose to go with a natural gas engine, please make sure that, that you connect with your Cummins uh, representative or have your dealership connect with them um, so that we can spec it correctly. If you spec it, and, and this is talking about transmissions and rear axle ratios and those sorts of things, if you, if you spec it exactly like a diesel counterpart, it's not going to perform well. The engines have a different uh, power band and you just need to match all that stuff up together. And that, and that actually is true from older diesel to newer diesel. If you're, if you're replacing your older diesel, you order a new diesel. The new ones need to be spec differently than the old ones. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Greg, and, and he's going to talk about some of the fueling options. Well, thank you, Tom, and good day, everybody. I'm Greg Roche with Clean Energy. I think Eric did a great job of setting the stage of the case for natural gas, and Tom did a really good job of explaining the Cummins lineup of heavy-duty natural gas engines and, and how Cummins is all in with natural gas. I'm going to now talk about vehicle fueling, truck fueling, and also this mysterious magical renewable natural gas. And as, as background for everybody, uh, Clean Energy is the largest provider of natural gas fueling in the U.S. We have over 500 stations that we either own and operate or operate and maintain on behalf of third parties. And we're also a, a trailblazer and large dis, uh, marketer of renewable natural gas. So with that, we will dive right in. The key thing to remember for anybody thinking about natural gas trucks on the fueling side is this is a global industry for natural gas vehicles. In fact, the industry is much larger outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. So what does this mean? Uh, the equipment that makes up the fuel stations 
has really been worked out and proven on a global scale, which means we've got a proven reliable solution that also doesn't have the danger of technological obsolescence because of what you might experience with other newly emerging technologies. This is our, we've already gone through that period in our industry. There are two types of fuel, as was mentioned by Eric. There's LNG, liquid natural gas, and CNG, compressed natural gas. Either case, they both start off on the left hand of the little diagram there as either conventional natural gas or renewable natural gas. And from there, it's simply a matter of how they're brought to market. Liquid, of course, is liquefied to cryogenically cold temperatures, and compressed gas is transported through pipelines as, as CNG. Many places throughout the U.S. have a well-developed pipeline network, so there's many areas that can readily get CNG. And on the same token, LNG can be delivered anywhere in the U.S. as well. So you've got choices depending on what's best for your operation. Ultimately, for a fleet operator, it gets down to the, the station itself and fueling stations in our industry, just like with gasoline or, and diesel, are purpose-built for the time, kind of vehicle that they're set up to fuel. We have many flexible options in the natural gas industry for meeting the demands of our customers. Uh, as I mentioned, stations are purpose-built, so there are stations built specifically to fuel cars and small vehicles, as well as stations that are designed to fill semi-trucks and other large heavy-duty trucks. There's, there's two basic approaches for filling vehicles, uh, as you can see in number two on the slide, which is the fill time. So standard fill, also called fast fill. Most people are accustomed to that. You pull up to a fueling station, you connect to the station and you fill up and you're on your way. The other scenario is a time fill application, commonly done by the refuse industry, but can be done as others as well. And this is where you have a, an asset that can sit for a period of time. Maybe it's not used at night, like a refuse truck, and you have the opportunity to fill that up over a period of time, four hours, six hours, whatever you have available. And so there's some advantages for that kind of scenario if the asset is, is going to be rested for, for a period of time. I already talked about the CNG and LNG fuel types. What I didn't mention is that you can actually create CNG out of the LNG, which gives you even more flexibility for meeting customer needs in areas that may not have a pipeline, but they still want to do CNG. And people often ask, you know, what are the what are the trade-offs? How do you compare CNG and LNG? And that's actually a pretty detailed discussion, but at the very high level, CNG is readily available in many areas. There are more CNG stations than LNG stations. And typically you're gonna have lower fuel taxes on CNG and a, a lower fuel price on CNG. And fueling is, is very simple, so drivers like that. On the LNG side, if you're in a weight limited application, uh, LNG vehicles typically lighter, and also LNG can fill a, a pipeline gap if a location doesn't have a pipeline, then natural gas can still be brought there and converted to either or, or dispenses either LNG or CNG. This, this slide is fascinating to me because, you know, heavy-duty trucking first began adopting natural gas about 10 years ago with the introduction of of today's current technology, natural gas engines. So in, in short 10 years, there's now over 800 publicly available natural gas truck stations in, in the U.S. and Canada. So that, that speaks a lot to the ability of the infrastructure industry to flex and expand and grow with the market. Most metro areas have a decent and even a good network of CNG fueling, and most of the interstates on the main routes also have stations along the way. So today we live in a world where station infrastructure is often no longer a reason for the viability of going forward with natural gas. And, and it, as time goes on, more and more of these stations are going to be built in response to the demand of, of truckers. But from, a, from an intermodal standpoint, which commonly is in uh, populated areas, the urban areas. Many of those urban areas have already been built out with, with station infrastructure. So 
fleets can go ahead and readily deploy without worrying about where can they get fuel. This compilation of pictures speaks a lot about the versatility, flexibility, and scalability of natural gas infrastructure. And it, in a sense, it, it resembles the, the versatility of traditional fueling with diesel, but has some added advantages. You know, for example, we, we talk a lot in our industry about improving air quality. We can also talk about other environmental benefits, such as with these stations, you don't have any risk of soil contamination as you do with, with liquid fuels, because natural gas, being lighter than air, simply evaporates if there ever is a leak. So that's a big benefit for, from a land use standpoint. And from a driver standpoint, our, our industry works hard to get a traditional fueling experience to be as good as or better. And in fact, drivers actually like filling with CNG because they don't have spillage like they do with diesel, so they don't have the diesel mess and the diesel smell that they encounter. So drivers really appreciate that And in, in addition to you know, not having the, the noise from the diesel engine as with a natural gas engine. That's it on infrastructure. We're now going to switch gears to this, this magical fuel called renewable natural gas, or RNG. You know, back in 1985, when Back to the Future came out and Marty McFly and Doc Brown were, were cruising around in their DeLorean, you know, who would have guessed that they accurately portrayed that you can use waste to propel transportation? Well, that's exactly what we're doing today. We may not be pouring the miller directly into our, our vehicles, but we are basically taking advantage of that waste miller beer and turning it into a useful fuel. So what, what is RNG? What is renewable natural gas? Well, it's, you know, it's got a kind of a clunky name. It gets a little bit confusing because of the reference to natural gas. But at the, at the high level, RNG is it's a direct replacement, direct substitution for natural gas. They basically ride along in the same pipeline. And renewable natural gas is, as its name states, it's natural, it's sustainable, it's recycled from waste. And it's basically methane that's captured from these wastes, whether it's a landfill, a wastewater treatment plant, green waste, food waste, or, or livestock waste. And it's distributed under the same regulatory structure as, as other biofuels. So for those familiar with this, at the federal level, there's regulatory uh, framework around biofuels that generate RINs. And in California, California has its program for the low carbon fuel standard. The interesting thing to know is uh, renewable natural gas has been on the market for, oh, half a dozen or more years now, but it's grown rapidly. Today, there's, in California, over 70% of the natural gas used as vehicle fuel is actually renewable natural gas, and that will click quickly climb to almost 100% as some of the final fleets begin switching over to renewable natural gas. And because of the success on a national level, RNG production is growing rapidly. So we're, we're seeing a lot of interest and demand from customers outside of California to go on renewable natural gas. And we're happy to work with them to make that happen wherever they might be located. This is one of the most beautiful bar charts ever created. Tom mentioned this in his presentation. Today, the world is focused on decarbonization. And renewable natural gas, it's simply the best opportunity that we have to decarbonize fuel. And this chart, which comes from the California Air Resources Board LCFS program, compares the different options available for truck fuel. So diesel on the far left, that's the standard, that's the default, that's what most people use. Unfortunately, it's a high carbon fuel. And as we move across the chart from left to right, you can see here's how other lower carbon fuels stack up. We've got hydrogen, which oftentimes is produced from natural gas. We've got electricity that's generated from the California grid. And then we have a series of different types of renewable natural gas or different sources of renewable natural gas. So we have the landfill gas and wastewater treatment plant gas. 
both with very good emission reductions compared to diesel and on par very competitive with electricity and hydrogen. But then we go to the far right, where we are now with food waste and green waste, we are negative. And with dairy, with capturing methane from dairies, we are far negative. We are so far negative carbon that this actually is the, the best possible way that you can reduce carbon from your supply chain, where it's sub-zero. And it's a little bit hard to comprehend that, that you can be driving your truck and eliminating carbon from the atmosphere, but that is exactly what, what we're doing. And this next slide is going to show you how that can be. So RNG, I mentioned, it's produced from waste. So we've, we've illustrated here in the, the number one, capture and extract, illustrating a landfill and a dairy farm. So rather than letting the methane escape into the atmosphere, we're capturing the methane. So that has a tremendous greenhouse gas reduction benefit because methane is a very aggressive greenhouse gas. So that's step one is to capture the methane. Don't let it in the atmosphere. Step two is to process that. So we need to purify that waste gas so that it can be transported in the, in the nat existing natural gas fuel pipeline infrastructure. So from the point of production, whether that's a dairy farm in Indiana or a landfill in Texas, that captured gas is cleaned up, injected in the landfill where it can, or into the pipeline, where it can be used at a station downstream of the pipeline, wherever that is. From an engine standpoint, the engine doesn't differentiate between renewable natural gas and, and conventional natural gas. It's simply molecules of methane. So there's no impact on the engine at all. It's all, all it sees is a natural gas product coming to the engine. So this is the, the last slide on renewable natural gas, but na renewable natural gas really is a game changer for trucking. It's the one way that carbon can re be reduced by 70% to over 100%. It is a cost-effective fuel. It's actually, just like natural gas, less expensive than conventional fuels. This is a domestic product. We make this in the U.S. and transport it on our own U.S. pipeline, and it's 100% renewable. So you, you just don't get any better combination of that for decarbonizing trucking. I'm going to wrap up as a segue into Jason's presentation on grants that Clean Energy also has two incentive programs that uh, we're offering to, to customers, and they work hand-in-hand -hand with grants, so it's a, it's a nice combination. Uh, these are limited time, limited quantity offers, so if you're interested, don't wait. Jump on them now. But uh, the first offer is selling renewable natural gas fuel at $1 a gallon for the first year that you're using your truck. The second incentive is called Zero Now Financing, and this goes to address the comment made earlier by Eric that, you know, up front, there's an additional cost to buy a natural gas truck to pay for the, the tanks and the engines. So we have a program that will equalize the cost, the upfront cost of that truck to be the same as a diesel truck. And then the LNG or CNG that you use has a guaranteed discount to diesel. Coupled with grants, there's just no better way to get into natural gas trucking than through these programs. So with that, I will pass this off to Jason, and Jason can introduce to the audience about grants. Thanks, Craig. Uh, good morning to the folks uh, out here on the West Coast and to everyone else, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jason Lewis, a senior market advisor with SoCal Gas, and I'll be talking about everyone's favorite subject, which is money. And beforehand, a little about my company, uh, SoCal Gas is a natural gas utility, and we operate from the Mexico border to Central California. We're the nation's largest natural gas distribution utility with 21.8 million customers served through 5.9 million meters. I'll be going over the sources of that money, including various government grants and incentives, the mitigation plans for the diesel defeat device settlement, and how you can apply for the money and who can help you get some of that money to buy a brand new CNG truck with all the benefits you've heard about today. There are numerous grant and incentive programs across the country that can be used to replace diesel with a CNG truck with an equivalent range and power. The first program is a nationwide program called DIRA, or the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, 
program, which is ran by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Most of this money is available to truck fleets, um, that, and it can be obtained through money allocated from DERA to your home state, although there are also sometimes some specific programs that can be often found through the grants.gov website. For an example of programs available to port truck fleets, here in California, there is a program called the Carl Moyer Program. This uh, gives up to $100,000 per truck for fleets to replace a diesel truck with a new near-zero CNG. This program is run through local air districts, and there are other programs that will support fueling infrastructure, such as the Mobile Source Air Pollution Reduction Review Committee here in Southern California. But there are other financing programs that are dedicated to infrastructure, for example. And lastly, the, the HVIP is a, in California is a dealer-based program that provides point-of-sale buy-down for the purchase of a new Lonox truck. And drilling down even further, uh, in, here in Southern California, our ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach fall under the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And the uh, additional funding is all, can be available by responding to RFPs from the en local energy commission and also through working with uh, your state energy commission, the local air district, as I said, in, here in the South Coast, or even directly through the ports of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And an example of that is a partnership that was done with the CEC, the AQMD, and the ports to put together a package of $14 million in total to replace 140 port trucks. Um, and if you didn't want to do the math, that's at $100,000 per truck. And we're very proud that our local ports are partnering to finance some of these new truck programs. On this slide is a current map of the status of the Diesel Emissions Environmental Mitigation Trust. Each state has either completed or is nearing completion of their NOx mitigation trust plans. Most all states have a Class 8 freight and port drayage truck option as a part of their list of eligible mitigation actions, which means there is money available for replacing diesel trucks with cleaner technologies like CNG. For example, as a part of Texas' plan, the mitigation trust funds can be used a non-federal voluntary match for DERA money. So in Texas, they're actually using some of this uh, mitigation trust money to be matched with DERA money to replace trucks, which is a great example of using a different combination of the sources of funding to offset the high, what can be the off, high upfront cost of these trucks. And of course, we all want to know how do we apply for this funding? And while all this information can be can seem overwhelming, considering everything you already have to do in your day-to-day -day operations, um, there is help. Applying for funding can be as simple as a conversation with your dealership partners. The CNG industry is working with all the major OEMs to give you options. So whether you're a Freightliner fleet or prefer a Kenworth rig, there's a CNG option out there for you. Additionally, there are regional and natural gas fueling providers, as Clean Energy just presented their option, who are waiting with dedicated professionals to help find you the money available to get you switched over to CNG. And if you're a fleet in Southern California, I'm one of those professionals you can count on. There are also consulting firms as well as industry organizations like NGV America and your local state natural gas vehicle coalition that have resources available to help fleets navigate this very large financial world. And speaking of the industry, uh, the partnering doesn't end once you buy your first CNG truck. The CNG and natural gas industry works in concert with the very same organizations you work with daily. We work to educate the local port authorities on what CNG can do for their environmental obligations, and we're also working with the local air districts who regulate the pollution and set the emissions rules. CNG is a fuel that not only saves you money on fuel and maintenance, but it also helps the local air districts attain their NOx and particulate matter thresholds. And the same partners who help you buy the truck are here to help you keep these trucks fueled, maintained, and kept on the road, moving America's goods from ship to warehouse. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to shamelessly pitch a local Southern California program put on by SoCal Gas, our truck loan program. We offer a free 12-liter CNG truck for fleets to operate for up to two weeks with the CNG fuel included in that free cost. We're looking for fleets who are inside of two years in their buying cycle and currently operate a similar diesel truck. We renewed this program from last year, and our queue is open for new applicants. And if you're interested or might know of someone who is, please feel free to email me directly or at the email address shown below. And with that, I will turn it back over to Hal for Q&A. Fantastic. Well, guys, that was great. It definitely engendered a lot of questions. 
Uh, we've got a couple of good ones. There's a couple here that, that are sort of related. A couple of folks from the Pacific Northwest, and they're asking about, do you guys know of any intermodal carriers that are currently operating natural gas powered units in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Tacoma specifically, I think to the ports, but also there's also some interest in any programs that you've talked about that are available in either Oregon or Washington. This is Jason. I'll jump in quickly and say that I know that both Oregon and Washington, the environmental organizations that represent the state are very interested in alternative fuels, including uh, natural gas. I can put folks in touch with folks from the Puget Sound Air District. I directly work with them at, at various conferences and events, and they're very interested. Uh, I don't off the top of my head know of a fleet, but I could get that information to you. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah, this Thank Tom, you, Jason. Yeah, Tom, Tom, this is Tom. We do have some contract mail carriers running in the Pacific Northwest. It's not containers out of the port, but from the engine's perspective, uh, weight is weight is weight. and you know, it's pulling a box, and so they're running those contract carriers for the U.S. Postal Service. Now, just for folks' reference, I've put up presenters' contact on the slide currently, so you guys are, are able to get in touch with folks. Here's a, a quick one about general terms. Can a diesel truck be converted to natural gas? Anybody can take that one. Yeah, so this is Tom Swenson with Cummins. It, it, is, it is technically possible, but we tend not to go down that path uh, just because these Systems are integrated, the fuel system and the engine and, and, the, and the chassis, and especially with onboard diagnostics and, and those sorts of things. And, and, but we tend not to do it just from a practical perspective. It tends to be a better fit to, to order new, although we do have active programs to use natural gas equipment and repower them with the latest engine, because then all of those subsystems are kind of already set up to, to deal with the natural gas. That, that makes sense. Um, uh, here's just a, a quick uh, crowdsourced answer uh, for the folks in, in Seattle, Tacoma. Castans Inc. is currently using seven tractors working in the, the Seattle, Tacoma ports for, for the folks that was asking about, for the folks that are currently using natural gas up there. Here's a question for you. We have LNG 2010. Do we need to change them for CNG? Uh, this is Greg. I guess I would answer it. There's no reason to change it unless you're ready to get new trucks for regulatory reasons with new changes in the port rules or you're looking to get newer trucks because they're getting a little bit old. From a um, you know, Operationally, as long as they're still running, there's nothing wrong with to keep running. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's a question. I'm not sure... It says, what are the road use taxes for um, CNG? The road use taxes are very, very local, it's similar to liquid fuels. You've got a federal excise tax on fuels, and you've got each jurisdiction, state, and, and so forth has their own fuel taxes. So it's more of a, and I'd be happy to answer that question offline for somebody who wants to know for their specific area. Got it. Okay. We've got a few more here, and I'm going to try to, to race through a couple of these to get to folks' questions. But um, in terms of the sort of incremental costs of, uh, of a natural gas unit versus a diesel-powered unit, are there significant differences? Yeah, this is Jason. Uh, depending on what kind of range you're looking for in your tractor, you're looking uh, at about a uh, fifty to $70,000 incremental cost. And that's really what a lot of these financing programs are targeting is get, making sure that when you're making that purchase that your uh, out-of-pocket would be the same as if you're replacing a, a diesel tractor. Makes sense. There's a couple of questions here or, uh, sort of around the same, so I'll, I'll try to meld them together. Use Class 8 power units uh, are getting harder and harder to find, um, and that, that's a favorite place for a lot of intermodal operators to look for power units. How challenging is it to get a natural gas power unit currently? We called up a dealer and wanted to order one. Yeah, this is Tom. It, it's really just finding a build slot within the preferred chassis that you want. From an engine build perspective, we don't have any restrictions. We can get one, you know, in, in you know, 30 to 45 days. Got it. Which is kind of normal industry practice. You know, just getting getting a truck period these days is tough. My understanding is that that both PACCAR and, and Freightliner have put their dealers on allocation, which might even help the cause, because that means they know what their assigned build slots are. So 
I think you you really got to go in and, and go to the dealer and and find out what they you know what they have available. There's no restriction on getting a natural gas truck per se, other than securing a build slot, which is, they're hard to come by these days. So this is Greg. I'll just add to that. You know, as a real world example, it was announced today about a port of LA Long Beach trucking company taking delivery of their first five near zero trucks. So uh, while it takes takes some time, advanced time, as Tom mentioned, to order the trucks because the truck manufacturers are busy, it certainly can be done. And they're ready, willing, and able to take the orders. That's great. But I want to give one, one last question, because so I think from the driver's perspective, I think it's important. So from the driving experience, you know, from the, the actual operator's seat, how different is it driving a natural gas power unit versus a diesel power unit? Uh, this is Tom. As long as the truck is set up correctly, from a power and performance perspective, it's not any different um, if you're comparing like for like. Uh, we, we have had some folks that have come out of some used equipment that they got, you know, that were 600 horsepower, you know, 2250 foot pounds of torque and and it's a bit of an unfair comparison because they're they're two different classes of performance of of the engine. So if you're looking at comparable equipment, which the 12 liter in an intermodal application that's comparable equipment, you're not going to uh, from a performance perspective, you're you're really not going to see any difference in terms of power and and torque and ability to get the job done. We have had uh, one of the port operators down in, in Long Beach in L.A. has uh, has a number of, of these trucks. And, and the story that he likes to tell is they went from worst to first. So when they were first uh, initially deployed into their fleet, the drivers were, were hesitant to use them. And, you know, they, they'd, they'd heard stories about performance wasn't very good and, and those sorts of things. And, and they had to actually incentivize them to the drivers to drive the, the trucks. And, and now the drivers actually choose them first because they, they, the way they're set up is it's a pool uh, system. And so the drivers now get, you know, they come and, and the most senior drivers take them because they like the performance and the power, but they also like that they're quiet and uh, they don't go home smelling like diesel. Right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing this great information about the opportunities that natural gas represents for the intermodal supply chain. If you'd like more information about taking advantage of natural gas, don't hesitate to contact our presenters. If you'd like more information about IANA, please visit intermodal.org. Thanks for joining us at IANA, the connecting force behind freight.